Good morning and welcome to the Unitarian Universalist Church of Brunswick, Maine. My name is Michael Kane and I'm a member of our Board of Trustees. Our charity with Soul this month is Habitat for Humanity. There are several different ways to donate to Charity with Soul, all described in the current issue of the PM. Today's service will be led by Reverend Justine Sullivan, whose topic is Telling Our UU Stories. I hope you enjoy the service and thank you for joining us.
Our opening words are by Richard S. Gilbert. We meet on holy ground. We meet on holy ground, brought into being as life encounters life, as personal histories merge into the communal story, as we take on the pride and pain of our companions, as separate selves become community. How desperate is our need for one another, our silent beckoning to our neighbors, our invitations to share life and death together, our welcome into the lives of those we meet and their welcome into our own. May our souls capture this treasured time. May our spirits celebrate our meeting in this time and in this space for we meet on holy ground. Today, we're going to be talking about the seven principles of Unitarian Universalism, 
we're going to use the book Everybody is Important, A Kid's Guide to Our Seven Principles by Jennifer Daunt, along with some images from the UUA website. The seven principles of Unitarian Universalism are promises that we make to each other and to ourselves that help us to be the best people we can be. The principles are about how we should treat each other, what we love, and what we hope for ourselves and all living things. Every day gives us a chance to put our principles into action. Our first principle affirms and promotes the inherent worth and dignity of every person. In other words, we believe that every single person is important. Our second principle affirms and promotes justice, equity, and compassion in human relations. More simply put, we treat one another with respect. Our third principle affirms and promotes acceptance of one another and encouragement to spiritual growth in our congregations, which is another way of saying we spend our whole lives learning how to be the best people that we can be. Our fourth principle affirms and promotes a free and responsible search for truth and meaning. In other words, together we learn about the world and what is true. Our fifth principle affirms and promotes the right of conscience and the use of the democratic process within our congregations and in society at large. More simply put, everyone has the right to use their voice and be heard. Our sixth principle affirms and promotes the goal of world community with peace liberty, and justice for all, which is another way of saying that together we work to create a world that is peaceful and fair for everyone. And finally, our seventh principle affirms and promotes respect for the interdependent web of all existence of which we are a part. In other words, we respect our earth and all living things. Our principles originated in 1960 when the Universalist Church of America and the American Unitarian Association decided to join together to become the Unitarian Universalist Church. There were originally only six principles, but that was changed in 1984 when we updated and reworded to the version we have today. So not only do these principles reflect the hopes that we have for the future, they also serve as a reminder of our rich history. And now let us enter into a time of meditation and prayer. I would invite you to take a deep breath with me in and out. And if you're sitting, let yourself be held by the chair or the sofa that you're sitting on. Feel your feet on the ground. And again, a nice slow breath in and out. Spirit of life and love, we know that in this beautiful world, there is both joy and sorrow, both peace and war. We pray this day, especially for the people of Palestine. May they find a way forward to be safe. And may all the people living in that part of the world find a way to share the resources and the land. May there be peace among all the people of the earth. And may those who are suffering from COVID, those who have lost loved ones, find comfort and healing in the embrace of community. And may we all be together again soon. May it be so, blessed be, amen, ashe.
Reading from a letter from Thomas Jefferson to Dr. Thomas Cooper. Dear Sir, Your favor of October the 18th came to hand yesterday. The atmosphere of our country is unquestionably charged with a threatening cloud of fanaticism, lighter in some parts, denser in others, but too heavy in all. I had no idea, however, that in Pennsylvania, the cradle of toleration and freedom of religion, it could have arisen to the height you describe. This must be owing to the growth of Presbyterianism. The blasphemy and absurdity of the five points of Calvin and the impossibility of defending them render their advocates impatient of reasoning irritable and prone to denunciation. In Boston, however, and its neighborhood, Unitarianism has advanced to so great strength as to now humble this haughtiest of all religious sects. That Unitarianism will, ere long, be the religion of the majority from the North to South, I have no doubt. Bye.
How many Unitarian Universalists does it take to change a light bulb? There is a long, sacred tradition of gathering in darkness. Who are we to intrude on that darkness by imposing light? It's good to be able to laugh with each other and at ourselves, at our seriousness and with affection for our desire to get things right. But in these times of trial and tribulation, more and more people are finding their way into our churches, fellowships, meetings, congregations. Even during a pandemic when everything is online. And we need to be able to talk about who we are. How many of you have found yourselves on the receiving end of one of these questions? What's a Unitarian Universalist? What do Unitarian Universalists believe? It's time for us, my friends, to work on our elevator speeches. That's uh, the time you have when you get into an elevator with someone and they say, what's a Unitarian un Universalist? And by the time you arrive at your floor, you have explained it to them, an elevator speech. I was inspired to work on my elevator speech while on my honeymoon. Dale and I had gotten married legally in Massachusetts in 2004. It was a beautiful day, a perfect day. I was on a beach, Cinnamon Bay in St. John, impossibly blue water, sitting on a beach chair, my feet partially buried in the warm sand, a book in my lap. I'd read a page or two, snooze for a bit, wake up, go for a swim, return to my chair and my book. I was on vacation. We were staying at a campground and our site was about a hundred feet from the beach. We got to know the other people staying there, including this one man that we'd spoken with a few times before. And on this day, he approached us on the beach making small talk. Then the conversation turned to church as it often does when we're getting to know people. And then he started talking about Jesus. And he asked if I had accepted Jesus as my personal savior. I explained that we were part of a church community, but that that was not our theology. He continued. It started to feel like not such a friendly conversation. Was he there to save us? I tried to remember my elevator speech, but words failed me. Of course, in an actual elevator, I would have been wearing pants. I was in a bathing suit and a floppy hat, not exactly a power suit. I felt naked, unprotected, and it probably didn't help my cause any that the book in my lap, the book I was reading was The Da Vinci Code. I must confess, I don't remember exactly what I said. I mumbled and stumbled my way through something, and I think I finally asked him to leave. It's kind of a blur, but after that encounter, I was determined to learn more about our faith and to be ready next time. In fact, maybe I should thank that man as one of my teachers. Ten years after that day on the beach, I was enrolled in seminary, pursuing ordination as a Unitarian Universalist minister. So what do you do when you have an encounter like that? You meet someone new, or maybe you get into a deeper conversation with a coworker and you tell them that you're a Unitarian Universalist and you're met with what? What's that? That's not a real religion. That's the one where you can believe whatever you want. You've heard them all, right? Now, I should tell you that as the daughter of an attorney, I have a lot of experience losing arguments. So what are some possible strategies? Well, you can argue, you can try to shout them down. We certainly see and hear a lot of that on cable television news and on talk radio. It's not a real religion. Yes, it is. No, it's, that doesn't really work, does it? Just the going back and forth. Or you could insult their religion. For example, bring up something really bad that a prominent member of their faith community did. If there are indictments involved, all the better. 
Now this one might feel satisfying, but as you might imagine, it is fraught and it's rather mean-spirited. I mean, who would want to be judged by the worst behaved members of their community? You could also try responding to their specific questions. And this one has a lot of promise. For example, what do Unitarian Universalists believe? Well, we don't believe in God. Well, some of us do, but not like the old guy up in heaven directing things. And I'm pretty sure that Jesus walked the earth, but you know, it's highly unlikely that he was actually born in December. Star charts from 2000 years ago suggest that the only time a star like the one described in the gospels would have been visible to the naked eye was in the spring. I mean, that was just the early Christian church co-opting the pagan holiday of the winter solstice. And what does any of this have to do with Unitarian Universalism? Why do we insist on putting so much energy into a passionate discussion of what we don't believe? We do have Unitarian Universalist faith communities in our communities, we have a diversity of beliefs about the existence of God, about the nature of good and evil, about what happens after death. But what we agree on and what defines us as a faith is our belief in each other, our commitment to walk together, understanding that how we are together matters. Our role as a faith community is not to provide answers to life's big questions, as much as we might all wish for, greater certainty at times. No, our role is to accompany one another on life's journey, to help us call forth our best selves. And this is the thing, something I learned from losing all those arguments with my father, and now with my brother, who's also an attorney, the one who frames the question almost always wins the debate. What if instead of entering into a debate or argument and letting someone else decide what questions we will answer, we assume that what folks really want to know is, why are you a Unitarian Universalist? What if we shared the stories we love, the ones most important to us? What stories would you share? If you love history, maybe you would share the story of our religious forebears, the Puritans and the pilgrims who crossed the Atlantic in search of religious freedom. The Church of England was becoming too hierarchical, too subject to, corru to corruption. So these folks came to New England and founded autonomous churches, free of any central authority, responsible for their own governance. These are the first parish churches, many of them Unitarian Universalist, that you see all across New England. You might share the story of the Dedham Church, founded in 1637. Boston was starting to get pretty crowded in the 1630s, and people began to spread out a bit, building homes and farming land in Dedham, about 20 miles away from Boston. That was too far to travel for worship, so they decided to build their own church. But before they laid one brick, they spent a year meeting in each other's homes, getting to know each other, discussing how they would make decisions. They understood that how they would be together was essential to their success as a community of faith. A Unitarian Universalist congregation worships in that Dedham Church to this very day. We Unitarian Universalists have inherited a long and rich legacy of covenant at the center of religious life. Or you might share a story from daily life here at UUCB, something that stands out for you, reminds you of how fortunate we are to be a part of this community. This is a story that I might tell if someone asked me today, why are you a Unitarian Universalist? And like a lot of my stories, this one happened at a general assembly. This one was in St. Louis. 
uh, gosh, at least 10 years ago. And one of the highlights of that General Assembly in St. Louis was a children's choir. It was like middle schoolers, all treble voices, all you, you kids singing together in this concert at this old church. And so the, the kids practiced before they gathered. And then during the week of General Assembly, there was this choral conductor hired to teach the kids and conduct them in their concert. She was someone that taught at the graduate level, a real big shot. And during the concert, the children sang beautifully. And this conductor looked as proud of these singers as if she were conducting a concert at Carnegie Hall. And it was wonderful to see these children taking themselves so seriously, pursuing excellence, all the songs memorized, sung beautifully, with this adult just adoring them and appreciating them and encouraging them. And it was a wonderful evening of music. And I was there with a friend and we walked back to our hotel. It was still early and we decided to get a drink in the lobby bar. And so my friend went to get a table and I went up to the bar to get our drinks. And there I see standing all by herself, the conductor from the concert. So I walked over to her and told her how fabulous it was and how much I appreciated her um, time with the kids. And I realized that she was alone and I invited her to join us, which she did. And we sat for a while and traded stories. I asked her about her own religious journey, which was not a happy one. Um, although she is an organist and a choral conductor, for her, church was just a job. And uh, in fact, she was hesitant to accept this um, job at General Assembly because it was a church group. But she'd been reassured that it, that it would be okay. So we talked about the kids and she said, you know, these, these kids are really amazing. And I said, oh, thank you. And she said, no, 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 I'm not just saying that. These kids are truly amazing. And I said, well, tell me more. What's so amazing? And she said, well, you know, we were practicing and the children sang beautifully. And I, I told them that they were doing great. And I said, now who can tell me? And before I even got the question out, hands were raised. But I said, who can tell me what this song is about? Um, we were singing, Shall We Gather at the River? And I said, what do you think the river is? And one little girl just raised her hand higher than anyone else's. I called on her and she said, I think the river is really the Milky Way. And you know, we're all a part of it. I'm a part of it. You're a part of it. We're all a part of it. All a part of the Milky Way. This young theologian, and as this choir director told the story, her eyes teared up, my eyes teared up. Suddenly, everybody was listening to us as she told this story. Our children are truly amazing. So that's a story that I might tell. If someone asks you, what do Unitarian Universalists believe? Don't get pulled into answering that question because it is not our beliefs that define us. It's how we are together, how we walk together that makes us Unitarian Universalists. Thomas Jefferson was convinced that before long, everyone would see the light and embrace Unitarianism. Jefferson was a man of letters and science, and he appreciated Unitarians' embrace of human knowledge and reason as part of the relationship with the divine. And I'll admit that when I first found Unitarian Universalism, I wanted everyone to join my faith, and I thought, sure, they would, if only they understood it. And let's be honest, there's a certain arrogance in that, an arrogance that has been part of our faith's history, too. Unitarians, for example, thought that those with, with less formal education, for example, the Universalists, couldn't possibly understand the complexity of Unitarian theology. I'm not sure the complexity makes a theology good. It just makes it less accessible. And I think our reputation for being elitist has been justified at times. But Unitarianism has been tempered by Universalism, and our faith has changed with the times, ordaining women, people of color, gays, lesbians, transgender people, standing with the oppressed, 
working to live our values in the larger world and in our interactions within our faith communities. There are moments in our history, including our recent history, that make me cringe. But that is part of the story as well. And we should all know about our history as completely as we can. The Sufi poet and mystic Rumi said, if you are irritated by every rub, how will your mirror be polished? If you are irritated by every rub, how will your mirror be polished? The challenges we face sometimes from people outside our faith are opportunities to talk about what we love. If someone really wants to know about your faith, tell them your story. Tell them why with all the thousands of things that you could be doing on a Sunday morning, you choose to be here even online, and why you're also here on Tuesday nights and Wednesday nights and Thursday nights, and why you make the coffee and bring goodies to share and bring meals to people who are sick, and you sing and offer readings and worship. Why? Why are you here? That is the compelling story. Maya Angelou said that people will not remember what you said or what you did, but they'll remember how you made them feel. And maybe that is what we should be sharing. How does it feel for you? What is the impact that being part of a community of faith, of this community of faith, has on you? What story would you share? Maybe you would share the moment when you knew that this was your church and these were your people. Maybe it was the way that you were welcomed when you first arrived or the day that you were married or your child was dedicated, a loved one buried. Joining in the walk for Habitat for Humanity or volunteering at the ReStore, the first time that you attended General Assembly and joined with hundreds or even thousands of people singing Spirit of Life, these are our stories, our sacred stories. So after worship today and over the coming days and weeks, I invite you to share your stories of why you love this faith and this community. Share those stories with me and share them with each other. And when someone asks, what is Unitarian Universalism? You'll be ready. Whether you are in an actual elevator wearing pants or sitting in a beach chair, looking out at the turquoise water, wearing a bathing suit and a floppy hat. May it be so. Our closing words are by Manish Mishra Marsetti. 
The universe sings no less because time and space wear us thin. The music calls us to recognize our limitations, to recognize that the song is best sung with others. Peace and love to you, my friends. <laughs>